It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Great to see kids being baptized. You did a great job, brother. That was good. That was good. Uh, and so good to have Mark and April here with us this morning and uh, being able to pray for you guys. That's awesome. I won't say too much because I'll start crying. And uh, we don't want that. Not yet, anyways. <laughs> But well, we're going to be in Mark chapter 11. So if you have your Bibles, I encourage you to go and open and put your finger on Mark chapter 11. That's where we're going to be in this morning. And I don't know if you heard it, but last week in the news, you may have heard of, uh, of the British Airlines Flight 3271, which filed the wrong flight plan. And they took their passengers to Edinburgh, Scotland, instead of to Dusseldorf, Germany. It's twice a way away, but <laughs> when they landed, obviously, there was confusion all over the place. The flight attendant asked them for a show of hands, how many of you think you were supposed to be going to Dusseldorf, Germany? And every hand was lifted up, and when they, <laughs> they said, well, not every passenger can be wrong, so therefore, we must have made a huge mistake. Now, you see, the airline was very sincere in their desire to take in the passengers to the right place, but they were wrong in the flight plan that they established for that flight. Some uh, 35 years ago, I think I'm correct, Xiaomi and I got married. Actually, August 4th will be 35 years. She's still hanging in there. Yes, sir. But when we got married, I had a plan. I was uh, a very young guy, not 23 years old, very naive. And I said, honey, I'm going to be a millionaire, and I'm going to retire by the age of 40. Obviously, I didn't accomplish my goal. <laughs> Obviously, right? But I had good intentions. I had the best intentions. I was very sincere in my mind that I was going to accomplish this goal. And to that end, I worked like there was no tomorrow. I worked 14, 16-hour days, seven days a week. I was on the go. I was on the go. And five years into our marriage, if you were to look at our situation from 1984 to 1989, our financial situation was much, much better. So I was producing, man. I was producing. We had a house. We had a couple of kids. I was on the go. But my marriage was falling apart. My marriage was absolute disaster. As a matter of fact, sometime in 1989, we were in Fort Lauderdale, the court, <laughs> and not for just visiting. See, I, I was sincere in my desire to provide for my family, but I was wrong in the way I, I went about it. See, many of us are sincere in what we do, but sometimes we're wrong in the way we do it. And these two examples show us that we can be sincere and be wrong at the same time. That's what I'm calling today, sincerely wrong. As we look at our passage this morning, I want us to first understand what was going on. Let's understand the circumstances, see what was going on. Then I want us to look at the crowd, what I'm calling the sincerely wrong crowd that was following Jesus. And then I want to see if we can, uh, or attempt to see if we can bring it home to us and make some application out of it. So, so please open your word, the Bible, with me. If you don't have it, we'll put the verses up on the screen. Well, I'll start reading on the first verse of Mark chapter 11. It says, Now when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter, as you enter it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. So untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Just say, the Lord has need of it, and, and we'll send it back here immediately. And they went away and found the cold tied at the door outside in the street, and they don't tie it. And some of those standing there said to them, what are you doing untying the cold? And they told them what Jesus had said, and they let him go. And they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their clothes on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their clothes on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. And those who, want, who went before and those who follow were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David, Hosanna in the highest. 
And he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around of uh, everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Let's pray. Lord Father, this morning as we open your word, we understand that without the help of the Holy Spirit, Father, it's impossible for us to understand what you're telling us. The Bible says it's foolishness to those who don't have you in their hearts. Father, I'm praying that today your word will be clear to us. I'm praying, Father, that the Holy Spirit will give us ears to hear your word. And that you will be the one who speaks to our hearts. Father, don't allow my humanness to interfere with this message this morning, Lord. But speak to our hearts according to your will. We ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So as we, as we look at this, I want to split it in three parts, all right? And the first part is what I'm calling the biblical Jesus. I hope you understand as we go through what I mean by that, the biblical Jesus. So, so in order to understand what's happening, let's look at the biblical basis for what's going on. At this point in the narrative in Mark, we see Jesus coming into his last week, not only of his ministry, but the last week of his life. Okay, Jesus is coming into Jerusalem either on Sunday or, morning, or, or Monday. Some experts disagree on one day. But we know that by the end of that week, Jesus will be crucified. So this is the last week of Jesus' life. Is the last week of his ministry. On top of that, they're celebrating what is called the Feast of Passover, the celebration of the Passover feast, which is one of Israel's most important celebrations. And as a matter of fact, just as a, as a point aside, if you've never celebrated a Feast of Passover, this Thursday, April 4th, at 7 o'clock in Barris Chapel, we're going to be celebrating a, a Passover Seder meal. So you're invited to come on Thursday at 7 p.m. Okay. We got two people excited about that, so I'm glad at least two will be there on Thursday. I hope you all join them on the Passover Seder meal. Well, the Passover was a holiday that celebrated Israel's redemption from Egypt. If you remember with me, and I want to take you back real quick to Exodus, the book of Exodus. Remember when the plagues were coming up? The last plague that God sent, he sent the angel to go around the houses in Egypt, and he will kill the firstborn of each household. Okay? The way that Israel was going to get away from this or will be protected from it was to kill a lamb, and put the blood of the lamb on the doorpost. And once the angel will come and see the blood of the lamb on the doorpost, he will pass over that household and not touch the people inside. So this is what they celebrate. And at that time of Jesus, millions of people will come to Jerusalem just to celebrate the Passover. Some estimate as many as two million people will be in Jerusalem to celebrate this. So this is what we're seeing. We're seeing Jesus approaching Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. And, of course, now we know that he was going to be the Passover lamb that year, right? And that's what we celebrate when we celebrate Easter week. So first of all, I want to see three things that talk to us about Jesus being the biblical Jesus, the biblical Messiah. Okay, the first thing is that Jesus is the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. Jesus is the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. And you might say, well, Jose, where do you see that in the passage? Well, let me tell you this. Jesus' appearance, Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem on that particular day was not a coincidence. He didn't just happen to be by there, be close by there. And he said, well, let's go in today since we're already close. No, no, no. This was prophesied by the prophet Daniel way back in Daniel chapter 9. And he says this, the key verse is verse 25, but I'm going to read 24 and 25. It says, 70 weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city to finish the transgressions, to put an end to sin and to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and prophet, and to anoint a most holy place. Now look at verse 25. Now know therefore and understand that from the going out of the word to restore and build Jerusalem to the coming of an anointed one, a prince, they shall be seven 
weeks. Then for 62 weeks it shall be built again with squares and moat, but in a troubled time. Now you see, the prophet Daniel said between this time and this time, there will be seven weeks. I'm not going to get into what that means and how long that is and all of that. But the experts say, experts like uh, Sir Robert Anderson, who was the former head of Scotland Yard, and Harold Honer, who was an American biblical scholar, they say that the day that Jesus walked into Jerusalem, which they think it was the 10th day of the month of Nisan, was the exact date predicted by the prophet Daniel in that prophecy. See, so Jesus fulfilled the prophecy of Daniel on that particular day. Now, if that wasn't enough, Jesus not only fulfilled the prophecy on the day he got there, but he fulfilled the prophecy in the way he got there, too. You see, the prophet Zechariah had written in chapter 9, verse 9, he said, Rejoice greatly, O daughters of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughters of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the fowl of a donkey. See, so Jesus didn't only come on the right day, he came in the right way as well. He, he fulfilled those two prophecies on that particular day and in that particular way that he entered Jerusalem. Now, if that wasn't enough, the experts say that there's over 300 prophecies that were fulfilled in Jesus Christ. You do the math if you want to check the probabilities on that. But Jesus fulfilled Old Testament prophecies, all of them. The second thing we can see here is that Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the Son of God. Now, last week we studied Mark 9. We were studying the transfiguration. You remember that? And in there, there was a voice from God that says, this is my son. Jesus, or God, verified the sonship of Jesus Christ on that day. And the Bible says that every biblical truth shall be established in the presence of two or three witnesses, right? And in that occasion, we had two witnesses from, from the sky, <laughs> Two celestial witnesses was Moses and Elijah who were dead and just showed up. And we have three ocular witnesses, Peter, John, and James, right? So that truth was verified by two or three witnesses. In this case, two celestial witnesses and three ocular witnesses. Jesus is the Son of God. Now today, in this lesson, you might say, well, where is that here? Well, if you looked at verses 2 to 6, you will see that Jesus knew where the cult was going to be, that he was going to be tied, that there were going to be people around him, and he even knew what he had to say in order for the owner to let him go. See, Jesus demonstrated his omniscience in these verses. He demonstrated that he is the Son of God and that he is God. Amen. So Jesus not only fulfilled the Old Testament prophecies, but he demonstrated who he was. Now, thirdly, he demonstrated that Jesus is the awaited Messiah. He demonstrated that he was the promised Messiah to come. It is interesting to me that previous to this day, we see Jesus doing a bunch of miracles, right? He was healing people. He was uh, bringing people back from the dead. He was doing all kinds of miracles. But it seemed to me that every time he did a miracle, he told the person, don't tell anything to anyone. You know, now you can see, fine, go home, but don't tell anybody. Even he told Peter and the, and the disciples when he asked them, who do people think they are that, that I am? I'm sorry. And then he said, and who do you think I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ. You are the Messiah. Well, fantastic, but don't tell anybody. Okay, I'm glad you know it. My father revealed it to you, but please don't tell anyone. But he doesn't do that here. He doesn't do that here. Look at two things that we see very clear. We see a clear statement of Jesus saying who he is in these two things. First of all, it says that the crowd was laying their clothes on the colt and on the way, and on the road. And this was a clear act of homage to a king. You can go back to 2 Kings chapter 9 and you'll see that when a king was coming in, they will throw their clothes on the floor. 
It was a, a representation that, yes, you are that important person. You are the king. But it was also an act of submission. It was an act of submission. So here we have the people recognizing him as the king. Second, it says that they were spreading leafy branches. The apostle John and, and John it says that they were palm branches. And they were putting this on the, on the road as well. This was a sign of victory, of joy. This is a celebration. So here I am celebrating that my king, who I'm submitting to, is coming in. And Jesus didn't say, hey, stop, please. Don't tell anybody. Jesus received the worship. He accepted the worship. To me, that is a clear declaration and an open declaration that he is the king and he is the Messiah. See, Jesus didn't come in hiding to Jerusalem. He said, hey, Jerusalem, here comes your king. Here comes your Messiah. He knew it was going to cost him his life. But he was making a clear declaration of who he was. That is our biblical Jesus. Now let's turn the things around. Let's turn this around at this time. And let's look at it from the crowd's perspective for a little bit. And I'm calling this part the unbiblical expectation. The unbiblical expectation. So as Jesus entered Jerusalem, we can see that a big crowd had gathered around him. Like I said before, those people that had seen the miracles, they saw Lazarus come back to life. They saw blind people see. And so there was a crowd already following. On top of that, there was a lot of people coming into Jerusalem. So obviously, there was a big crowd gathered around him. And they were singing. They were praising. And they were singing what is called the Hallel in the Bible. It's Psalm 113 to 118. It's called the Hallel. Normally they will sing that as they approach Jerusalem for the Passover. So they're singing this, and in this particular verses we see that they were singing Psalm 118 verse 25 to 26. And it's where it says in verse 9 in, your, in, in our reading, it says, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. And this is an, a very important psalm because as they worship Jesus with this, they are recognizing that he is who these psalms say he is. And if you read from Psalm 113 to 118, you're going to see that it talks about him being the son of God, the son of David, the coming king, the Messiah. And so as they're singing this, they are recognizing certain things about Jesus. Let me show you. First of all, they're saying Hosanna. Hosanna means save now. So as they're singing this, they're recognizing that Jesus could save them. They're saying, Jesus, save us now. We need a saver. We need a liberator. And Jesus, you can save us. Hosanna. But then they say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So they also recognize that not only can Jesus save them, that he comes from God as well. Blessed is he who comes from the Lord. He comes from God. Thirdly, that he was a descendant of David. It says, blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. And you remember, the Messiah, the king that will last for eternity, had to be a descendant of David. So they're recognizing he could save us. He is from the Lord. And he comes from David. He's a descendant. Lastly, they say, Hosanna in the highest, meaning that, they, that he deserve the highest praise. He deserve the highest praise. Now, I believe that this crowd was sincere in their praise. I believe they were sincere. But their expectations of Jesus and their hearts was wrong. You see, they, they praised Jesus because they expected him to be a liberator that will lead a rebellion against Rome. You see, they, they praised Jesus because they expected him to fulfill their dreams and prosper them. See, they praised Jesus because they thought he was who they wanted him to be. Not necessarily who the Bible said he was, but who they wanted him to be. 
See, I think they were sincere in their praise. They wanted a king, but they didn't want a theocracy. See, they, they, they wanted a, a deliverer, but they expected physical deliverance, not spiritual deliverance. And you see, what happens is when their expectations were not met, they turned their backs on him, and those same lips that were praising him at the beginning of the week were crying, crucify him at the end of the week. See, I think they were sincere in their praise, but they were sincerely wrong in their expectations. The crowd was sincerely wrong. And listen, my brothers and sisters, God does not want empty worship from us. God doesn't want our lip service. He doesn't want you to sing, in Christ alone I stand. And they say, well, Jesus, if you don't heal me, I'm done. That's empty worship. God said in Isaiah 29, 13, and in Matthew 15, 8, he repeated it. He said, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. See, and we're not unlike the crowd of that day. Many of us, if not most of us, come to Jesus with the wrong expectation. Many of us, and I will bet to say that most of us, come to Jesus with the wrong expectations. We, we, we come to him when we're at the end of our rope. And we come to him for rescuing, but we want our type of rescuing. Not his type of rescuing. We want our type. You see, we come to Jesus because we want Jesus to prosper us. Or we come to Jesus because we want him to take away all my sickness or all my addictions. Or I come to Jesus because I want him to fix in a moment everything that is wrong around me. We come to Jesus because I want him to change everybody around me. Not me, of course. But he can change my wife and my kids. You can do that for me, Jesus. See, we come to Jesus looking for our kind of Jesus. Not necessarily the biblical Jesus. And, and, and don't get me wrong. I think we come to him sincerely. I think we're sincere when we accept Jesus Christ. I think we come to him with our heart in our hands. But we come with the wrong expectations. And therefore, we are sincerely wrong. But thanks be to God, right? Thanks be to God that he doesn't give us the Jesus we want. You know what he gives us? He gives you the Jesus you need. Amen? I thank God that he didn't give me the Jesus I wanted. Because I probably would have been millionaire, retired, and lonely. But he gives us the Jesus we need. See, the Jesus we need is a spiritual deliverer. My friends, you don't need anything more than you need salvation. You don't need a new job. You don't need a new wife. You don't need new kids. You don't need new neighbor. You need Jesus. You need the deliverer to deliver you from your sin. Without that, everything else really doesn't matter. What profits a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul, right? In Luke 19, Jesus said, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. That's what we need. That's the Jesus we need. And the Jesus we need, not only our Savior, but he's our mediator between us and our Father. And we need that. I mean, every time I stumble, I'm so glad that Jesus is standing by the hand, right hand of the Father and saying, don't worry, I got him covered. Right? Some days I need that more than others. But, man, there are days that it's like, Jesus, please talk to him. He is our mediator. That is the Jesus we need. It says in 1 Timothy 2, 5, Therefore there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men. 
and that is the man, Christ Jesus. See, I don't need to pray to my mother because she's in heaven and say, Mom, help me with this. The only one I need to pray to is Jesus because he is my mediator. That's the Jesus we need. But my friends, for the here and now, the Jesus you need expects one thing from us, and that is full surrender. He expects full surrender. See, my Jesus is not the Jesus of the be happy, be merry, be prosperous, be healthy. The Jesus you need is the Jesus that said, take up your cross and follow me. See, the Jesus we need is the one that says, don't store for yourself treasures on earth. Instead, do it in heaven. See, the Jesus we need is the one that says, if you love me, you will obey my commands. See, the Jesus we need is the one that says, die to yourself today. Die to yourself daily. See, the Jesus we need is the one that says, consider others above yourself. The Jesus we need is the one that says, be generous. The Jesus we need is the one that is looking at you in your circumstance and saying, my son, my daughter, my grace is enough. My grace. I want to ask you this morning, what kind of Jesus are you following? Is it the biblical Jesus or are you still looking for your Jesus and be living disappointed because you haven't found him? Is, is your praise an honest praise? Are you giving Jesus lip service? singing the songs, coming to church, raising your hands, giving the offering, and then going home? Or are you sincere in your praise? Are you praising our Lord in spirit and in truth? Or are you sincerely wrong before God? What kind of Jesus are you serving? I want to invite you this morning as the team comes out, as we finish here. And the Lord has been working hard on me this week. And I'm hoping he'll do the same on you. And I want to invite you to come to the altar today and examine your relationship with Jesus. Let me tell you, it's, it's a painful examination. It hurts. But it's a life-giving examination. And I want you to, be, to invite you to come and ask honestly, sincerely from your heart, am I being sincere with you, God? Or am I sincerely wrong? Am I just giving you lip service? My friends, it's an important question. And it's a question that will mark the difference between what kind of relationship you have with your Lord what kind of relationship he wants to have with you. I invite you to come as they sing.